Well, welcome everyone to tonight's mm. Join Enough talk, Why Should Tax Justice Matter to Christians? And we've got a really good speaker tonight, and Kat Jenkins. Um, Kat works for the Ecumenical Council for Corporate Responsibility. She's also director of the magazine Positive News, which has been around a long time, it's a really good magazine. Kat has spent much of the past decade, though, working for environmental and social justice, including funding, founding and running the project The Other Island. In addition to all that, she works part time for us in Green Christian on our Join Enough campaign. And she is a wonderful addition to the Green Christian team. She's knowledgeable. She's been into offshore financial services, quarter of a century, written books on the subject. So I know we're going to have a good talk from her tonight. So Kat, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. And hello, everybody. Really don't know how I'm going to live up to that now, but I'll do my, do my darndest. And I want to say as well, for everybody who's here this evening, Thank you so much for um, being here. I'm sorry we had to rejig the session by a week, um, but I really appreciate you, you making the effort to be here. It's good to see you all. So what I'm going to do, if I may, is um, share my screen as I go through this talk. And then if anybody would like the slides afterwards, um, it's very easy for me to get them to you um, with any of the references. So without further ado. Would it be all right with everybody if I start us off with an opening prayer so we can be minded about why we're here and what we might be, how we might be called to think about tax? Is that all right? So, calm in breath. Faithful God, you're righteous, straight and true. Your just standards exalt nations. We pray that our leaders will make decisions on tax that uphold the highest standards so that all citizens everywhere can flourish. Help corrupt practices to be exposed and selfish pride to be overcome. Help compassionate policies be created and implemented so that all have the opportunity to thrive wherever and whoever they are in the name of Jesus, who gave up all rights and riches to be a servant. Amen. Can people hear me okay, by the way? Sometimes I'm a little far away. That's good to hear, see, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. So Barbara's just introduced me very kindly, um, but I'll give you a little more about me just to set some context, if I may. Um, I like to talk about myself as a recovered offshore tax professional because for a good 20 and odd years, um, I worked in the Isle of Man offshore finance sector and I was one of those bright eyed boys and girls that would be told, go and find a way to make sure that these people won't have to pay tax on this capital or income when they eventually want it back. And that, that's, it's an industry that's populated by good people doing unhelpful things sometimes. That's what that has taught me because um, I would think I was doing a good job because I had happy clients and I had a happy boss and I didn't really think about the impact of what I was doing on the wider world. We'll come on to that a little bit more as we go along. I had about 25 years in the industry and I worked in offshore insurance, offshore corporate and trust, uh, a while in regulation. Um, I've written um, mostly study texts for people working in the industry, but also just some stuff that I need to get off my chest. Um, and I have been with Church Action for Tax Justice since around July of last year. So that's a seems a sudden volte fast really, but the, the recovered offshore tax professional goes with um, a recovered lots of other things as well, uh, if I'm honest. So I had 25 odd years of what looked like a really successful career, lots of money, big house, big car, blah, blah, blah. But inside it was hollow. I'd lost sight of my faith. I um, was really about showing off, I guess. And then I had an alcoholic implosion. And in the course of what was a very difficult recovery, but with the grace of God, I've 
managed to sustain it for a good number of years now. In the course of that, I regained my faith. And I'd like to think I regained some of my moral compass as well. And so that brought me to want to do more productive things in the world. And um, I think I thought if I hung around with Christians and good people, some of it might rub off on me. Um, so <laughs> still work in progress. And I um, have a number of part time jobs, um, including a little admin for Green Christian, which I love. And I'm going to talk to us to, to you today about why tax justice, which might not sound the zingiest of subjects, should matter and could matter to Christians and why Church Action for Tax Justice, which is one of the programmes run by the Ecumenical Council for Corporate Responsibility, ECCR, um, why we should want to keep it uppermost in our minds when there are so much more obvious or, well, not easy, but immediate things to occupy us. And I'm going to ask maybe if you'd like to just throw a few words in the chat about what you think when you hear the word tax or tax return? Or even just, yeah, just throw a few suggestions in the chat. Do you roll your eyes? Do you think, woohoo, favorite time of year? What crosses your mind? Work. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, and another one. Complexity, very often, fair taxes work for the common good. That's great, just pay it, good for you, good for you. <laughs> okay, um, I'll just quote you what, uh, I'm sure many of us have heard of Adele, the singer. And in 2011, when she was starting to make pretty good money, Adele said, I'm mortified at having to pay 50%. I use the NHS, but I can't use public transport anymore. Trains are always late. Most state schools, are, I'm not going to use the word she used there. And I've got to give you like four million quid. Are you having a laugh? When I get my tax bill in, I was ready to go and buy a gun and randomly open fire. So to Adele, tax is not a lovely thing. And I think that's probably the case for many. We, use, we talk about the tax burden falling on certain people and so on and so forth. Um, how about the range of taxes that impinge on us? Um, maybe you could throw a few thoughts as to taxes in the chat for me. Tell me what, oops, tell me what um, taxes you can think of, not just the obvious ones, but maybe the ones that we come across less frequently. Let's see what people come up with. Oh, Rosie likes to trickle up. Yes, that's a good one too. So income tax, yep, the one that we're most of us painfully familiar with. There you go, you see I'm at it, painful VAT. Yep. Uh, come on, let's have a bit of road tax. Good one, yes. Not many people think of that when I um, put that little challenge out inheritance tax, bedroom tax. You see, we don't have inheritance tax here in the Isle of Man where I live. So I live in the Isle of Man, but I um, run the Church Action for Tax Justice programme in the UK and tramp around over there. Sugar tax, I don't believe it did happen. The legislation was drafted, um, but I think the industry put up R, N, I, yeah, yeah. And wealth taxes, thank you, Leonard. Okay, so, a good range of taxes that we've thought about here. Um, and some of them were introduced a long time ago, but intended to be very temporary. Uh, income tax was intended to be a temporary tax initially. Still waiting. And now I'm trying to move my, uh, my slides along. Why are you not going on? So people have mixed emotions about tax. The Catholic bishops of England and Wales said of the subject back in 2004 in the publication Taxation for the Common Good, tax is neither a burden nor an evil. It's a positive contribution to the common good and to responsibility of citizenship. And another individual 
uh, American Supreme Court Judge Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. back in 27, 1927, said, I like buying paying taxes because with them, I buy civilization. You guys came up with a great range of taxes before. Some of them are direct taxes, income tax. Some are indirect, so they're VAT, for example. Um, they can be progressive or regressive. A progressive tax is one that falls increasingly heavily on people who have more money and is more likely levied or not at all on people who are less wealthy. It can be levied on income gains, wealth, or even activity. Um, so things that you do, like smoke cigarettes, might att attract duties and taxes. But it's all being collected by, used to be two separate agencies, HMRC, H uh, HMC and Customs and Excise. Now it's all one big body. And what do we do with it? Well, there are many arguments for taxation. It can be a powerful tool for raising revenue. Although if you're a student of more modern economics, more modern than the type that I used to teach at the college, and you follow modern monetary theory, you might argue that actually that's a fairly minor role in um, what we use taxes for. But there's no doubt that um, very often when governments want to increase taxes on us for whatever reason, they can point to, well, we need money for the social security system, we need money for the health system, we need money for long term care. Um, it's often used as a justification for raising taxes, but there are other means by which governments can find the money to do the things they need very often. Still, it's there on the list. It's also a really powerful tool for redistributing wealth and reducing inequality. And inequality, I'd suggest, is almost more damaging to people and to society than is pure poverty. The fact that people have less than other people around them, um, the fact that sometimes the lack of wealth they have disadvantages them, closes off certain life options for them, makes it difficult for them to get the education that they might want and so on and so forth. Is, is really damaging. And in societies where you have greater inequality, you can show that there are a range of harms that come from that. So poorer health, poorer mental health for sure, increased crime, um, and generally uh, we all do better when we all do better. Um, an oversimplistic way of putting that would be if you give more money to people who don't have much, what are they gonna do with it? they're going to spend it so it goes into the economy. If you give more money to people who've already got scabs of it, very often they put it with the rest and that's it. But I don't want this to sound as though it's a philosophy of envy and jealousy. Um, there's more to it than that. And there's nothing biblical about saying wealth is bad, wealth is wrong. It's really about what you do with it. So tax can be a tool for raising revenue, for redistribution. It can also be used to take the heat out of the system in inflationary times. You give less people less money, they can go and spend it on fewer things. Um, so prices don't go up, supply and demand says that um, prices for many commodities will fall and inflation with, will fall. Um, we would suggest at the moment that's not the ideal tool for that because if you cut people's spending, particularly the poor and middle, by reducing their ability to buy their essential needs like food and clothing and warmth and power, that's really not a good model for a society or an economy. There are other tools that governments have at their um, disposal, um, interest rates, and they can um, sometimes be more targeted, but they take longer to come into mm, if, no, sorry, they take less time and they take less time to come into effect. So there are various tools and they have different effects. And um, sometimes the outcomes aren't always what people expect. At the moment, um, raising taxes on the 
working poor and middle is being seen as a viable way of managing inflation and interest rates are going up too so that's a double pinch on people it's also a tool for increasing democratic engagement so research shows that if you pay your taxes you want to know what's being done with it um, people have more interest in engaging with government with consultations with town hall discussions if they're paying taxes so we could reframe the way we think about tax um, instead of thinking of it as a as a burden as confusing and it is confusing the tax code is like shelves and shelves and shelves of, um, of law uh, and something that maybe frustrates us when we're trying to fill in our tax returns including online crashes over here every year and impoverishes us well it can do those things but it's also the way in which we make our contribution to society to the common good as we heard earlier and in doing so in many ways it's a way of loving our neighbor it's just that in the society structured the way that we have it today in most countries we mediate it through the government and through taxes you could argue that if you're paying tax you're a fortunate person because you have enough income or enough capital gain to be subject to tax and ideally those that are blessed with abundance will be in a position to share and not to begrudge it some of that with those who are less fortunate doesn't always happen but we can see why from a christian perspective with christian values in mind that would be the case i should say we don't always approve of how governments intermediate that process so um, we might say you should be spending on this not on that and what i think is important might not be what you think is important um, but it's overall it's the mechanism that we choose to use and we should pay our taxes we know that we're called to do so uh, we're called to observe the rule of law to obey the people who are elected to be in power over us and to make those laws and in romans 13 chapters 2 to 7 we read that whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of god and they will receive condemnation on themselves for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior but for evil do you want to have no fear of authority do what is good and you'll have praise for the same for it's a minister of god to you for good but if you do what's evil be afraid for it doesn't bear the sword for nothing for it's a minister of god an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil so we're being told there to obey the authorities that are in place therefore it's necessary to be in subjection not only because of wrath but also for conscience's sake for because of this you also pay taxes for rulers are servants of god devoting themselves to this very thing render to all what is due to them tax to whom tax is due custom to whom custom fear to whom fear and honor to whom honor it's interesting that isn't it um but also for conscience's sake because i don't know about you but i know people who believe that they have a christian code of conduct or even just a moral code of conduct so we christians don't have the monopoly on decency do we um but then when it's business sharp practice seems to be kind of okay uh well in this we always tell the truth but in that well that's business and we're being told here that's not the case it also that passage also smacks of a world in which authorities themselves could be assumed to be benign and that isn't always the case in every country perhaps not always the case in any country nevertheless I guess we have we're fortunate in that we have choices in whom we elect who we vote for at least and we have to have some faith and pray for those people to keep doing good in the world so tax justice tax justice matters both 
within our country domestically, your country, but I'll think of it as mine too, and internationally. So domestically in, a, in enabling, um, gaining revenue, redistributing money for the provision of public services, so payment of benefits, pensions, um, social care, all the other things that we want to see happening, the infrastructure around us. And internationally, it's just as important because it helps less developed countries if they can retain a fair proportion of the tax that goes on there, on the activities carried out there by foreign com companies, multinationals, in terms of resource exploitation and labour. So we're all familiar with stories of great big companies that are um, doing masses of business uh, in all sorts of countries around the world, but then ship off the profits to some low tax environment, um, do a bit of jiggery pokery in the books, the kind of thing that I used to get paid to dream up, um, and not nearly enough is retained by those countries to do the things that they're going to need to do to improve the standards of living of their people and to deal with um, increasingly in those countries, the impact of climate change. So figures produced not so long ago indicated that the amount of money um, denied to developing countries in tax through shifting profit bases is four times roughly the amount that's granted in aid by developed nations. And aid comes with strings, doesn't it? So if we let those countries keep a fair tax take on what we do there, the labor that's used there, the resources that we exploit from the ground or wherever it might be, they, their government can do with it as they see fit to suit their circumstances. But if we let big companies shift it all away and keep most of it in the developed world, so-called developed world, global north, then help them out through aid that almost always comes with strings attached. Strings as to how they'll behave, or sometimes it's loans, not grants. Um, you could say, I would say, that it's a, a latter-day form of colonialism. We're still keeping control. I'm sure there are those who disagree. So tax can do all the good things that we were talking about on an earlier slide, provided it's well-designed. It is just provided it's well-designed. Pope Francis earlier this year, February, I think, went to visit the Italian tax office to talk to tax collectors. And he said, tax must, he said it in Italian, but I'm not going to, tax must favor the redistribution of wealth, safeguarding the dignity of the poor and the least who always risk being trodden underfoot by the powerful. The taxman, when he or she is just, promotes the common good. So the Catholic Church sees proper administration of tax as being an essential tool for redistribution, provided it's properly designed. And that, we would argue at Church Action for Tax Justice, is the key. And there are huge injustices. In the past, catch um, mostly through my predecessor, uh, Justin Thacker, who some of you have probably come across, have campaigned on a whole range of issues on international tax agreements. You might have heard of a thing called the Biden tax. Uh, it was a globe, it's a, an initiative to, um, on the face of it, prevent multinationals from doing what they've traditionally done, which is ship profits off to low tax havens and um, stop developed countries from keeping their fair shares. And in fact, after much wrangling, the tax deal that's pretty much been arrived at, if he manages to get it through, which he hasn't yet, um, does, not does not make many poorer countries better off. In fact, for some of them, it actually leaves them worse off. There are those who are saying, well, something's better than nothing, we should we should do it. And there are others arguing that actually we should not bake in further injustice. We should hold on, hold out for a proper fair treatment for uh, the developing world who've already suffered so much in past bad behavior from 
many, many colonialist countries and now are still struggling to get back on their feet. Within our, own, within our own country, within the UK, there are massive council tax disparities. So it's not uncommon to find that people in a relatively poor neighborhood um, are paying much more in council taxes than those in a substantial property elsewhere. And uh, Justin ran a very effective campaign on that. Um, if you're interested in, some of the injustices are still there. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can find some videos that he made um, in the course of that. Uh, in fact, we've got a repository of short three, four minute interviews with people who are subject to that. And more recently, since I came, rising burden of income taxes on the working poor and middle. So lots of people will know that uh, the current government has increased um, national insurance contributions for both employers and employees. National, national insurance contributions, NICs, are a particularly regressive tax. That means they hurt the working poor far more than the working well paid. And that's because they're capped at a certain level. So over a certain level, you can earn more and more and more, but you don't pay more national insurance contribution. So the weight of it is falling on the working poor and middle. How can that be reasonable in times such as these? Um, it's also a tax that falls only on workers. So people who derive their income, what they live on from wealth, so rents and dividends and interest on a big pile of cash in the bank, don't pay national insurance contributions on that. It seems absolutely perverse, particularly in a time of cost of living crisis. We like to call it the cost of living scandal. When food prices are going up because of climate change and war, when energy prices are eye-wateringly going through the roof, when the universal credit boost that came about because of the pandemic has been reversed, so people are now 20 pounds a week worse off. When all of those things are, are hitting people and many people are in insecure employment as well, to increase that tax, tax burden on the poor seems absolutely perverse. It's at the highest level on the working poor that it's been since the war. Whereas for the very rich, when you include the various tax planning mechanisms they can use, it's low and sometimes seems virtually optional. Sorry, I'm seeming, sounding very grumbly. <laughs> so right now, what we're focusing on this year at Church Action for Tax Justice uh, is one main thing and then two others that are occupying a lot of our time. Our main ask at the moment is that the government introduces a wealth tax, a tax on the 1% of richest households in the UK. We're calling it the Good Measure Campaign and um, we have been delighted by how people have responded. So we have a letter to the, the Chancellor pointing out the pain that people are feeling trying to make ends meet and asking him instead to introduce a wealth tax, a one-off wealth tax on the richest 1% in the country. And then after that, a full review of personal taxes, so that on a regular basis, a wealth tax can be introduced that takes account of the, the impacts of inheritance taxes and capital gains taxes and capital income taxes. That's the income on a capital asset um, and all sorts of other things to make sure that for the long term, some of that complexity is washed out of the system and it's fair. But we believe that it's time for a wealth tax and Indeed, throughout the pandemic, whereas more and more ordinary families have been struggling, and a lot of those people were the same people that kept our bins emptied and our supermarket shelves stacked and our lorries bringing food um, to the UK and our loved ones cared for and our injections, <laughs> vaccinations done. Those sorts of people were the people who had to go out and risk their health and really, this is how we thank them. Um, 
so we're saying this is a really insecure, difficult time. It's really challenging for people. It's having an impact on all sorts of um, dynamics within families. Instead, please introduce these wealth taxes and remove some of that burden from the poor and put it on the shoulders, on the broadest shoulders. Surprisingly, we're not alone in this call. So when I proposed it at the start of the year, um, we have a number of allies. So we work with groups like Tax Justice UK, the Tax Justice Network, um, IPPR, a number of academic institutions so that we can make sure that our, our plans are sound and the projections, what we think would be the outcomes are sound. Um, and we said, we think it's time to campaign for this. And there was a sort of a collective around the table. There was a hmm, good luck. Let us know how you get on. Um, but, you know, David didn't let his knees knock when he faced Goliath. So we plodded on. And actually, wonderfully, there is a coalition of people lending their voices to this um, in countries around the world. So the Catholic Church in Europe is calling for wealth taxes. Oxfam International is calling for wealth taxes. Fight inequality around the world is calling for wealth taxes. But here at home and actually this week at Davos, where the rich and wealthy congregate, are a variety of groups, Tax Justice UK calling for a wealth tax, many others, but a group called Patriotic Millionaires. Um, if you haven't heard about them, look them up because we have been really heartened by how they've got behind our campaign. Um, so they originated in the States, but they have uh, like a provisional wing here in the in the UK and they stand outside the Houses of Parliament with banners saying, tax us, Rishi, it's not rocket science. And uh, so they're working with us on a number of campaign issues. Obviously, that's not most wealthy people, but it's some. So our focus is on introducing a wealth tax so that we don't have to keep putting the burden on the poor and the middle. But at the moment, we're also involved in um, asking for windfall taxes in respect of the energy crisis on the fossil fuel majors like Shell and BP, who have yet again recorded record profits while people are scratching around finding pennies to try and turn the heating on. Um, personally, I think windfall tax isn't a perfect term for it. Windfall sounds like Windfall sounds like something that happens by accident, doesn't it? Like a treat, something that falls into your hands, snap off a tree. Whereas actually, it's not a million miles from profiteering. Um, and we really believe that there should be, um, that perhaps it should be rechristened uh, an excess profits tax and could be relevant to the many other companies that did spectacularly well out of the pandemic and lockdowns when individuals were struggling. So we're engaged with a coalition of organizations, not just tax justice organizations, but also fuel poverty action um, and groups like that, and also environmental groups such as Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace. So we're finding it's bringing us in contact with some good allies. And our part in that is generally to try and mobilize church voices around it, and Christian voices, but also politically, um, when there's lobbying going on, we would normally catch, would normally take up the um, contact with bishops in the House of Lords and um, other Christians in politics. And then the other thing that's taken a surprising amount of time has been the economic crime bill. Start of the year, the thought of windfall taxes and the economic crime bill also seemed unlikely to happen. Uh, so the economic crime bill is about closing loopholes used by the rich and powerful to hide their money, sometimes ill-gotten, sometimes just money they don't want to pay tax on, um, using offshore centres and anonymity and the like. Uh, and Yet again, it was due to be kicked into the long grass. It's been on the statute books in draft for about six years. And government after government, administration after administration kept going, oh, too busy, not enough time in the legislative calendar. We won't bother with that. And then what happened? Russia invaded Ukraine. And everybody got very excited about sanctions and Russian money 
And that's really what breathed life back into it. And in an undignified scramble before the last break for Parliament, um, a part of the bill came through. And we worked very hard on that to um, ensure that it got support in, in various places. There is more of it to come in the next city in this in the coming sitting of parliament so you know it's interesting at the start of the year i've talked about three things that are engaging us and at the start of the year all of them sounded a little bit no hopey wealth tax windfall taxes oops wealth tax windfall taxes on profiteering and the economic crime bill and it just goes to show that god doesn't ask us to be successful god asks us to keep trying because sometimes when you think there's no hope of something coming about circumstances change under your feet and suddenly everything opens up we didn't expect ecb we didn't what, it sounds awful to there is nothing good about the invasion of ukraine there is nothing good about it but if we can find something good in the ability to clean up our reputation and our place as a haven for dirty money, then we should do that. And we should take that opportunity. I think I might be running a little over time. I'm going to talk a little more briskly. Ah, but I'll be repeating myself, so I don't need to do that. A one-off wealth tax on the richest 1% and a review. So if you would like to know more about that, our good measure campaign is on our website or and or we can send you details what we've effectively done to get the campaign moving it started in mid-february was work with um various academic groups so greenwich university and uh lancaster university i think and one of the london ones um and various other think tanks from bright blue which is a conservative think tank which is remarkably progressive to uh, Tax Justice UK and the IPPR and looking at work by the Wealth Commission and so forth we developed a position paper on why we think this can work and how we might be able to overcome the complexities of a wealth tax and some frequently asked questions for people who want something a little lighter to read. Last year we had a wealth tax pledge just asking people to click a box to say they thought it was a good idea and we were absolutely staggered by how quickly people responded to that um not so long ago um 2020 i think um there was a survey done of appetite public appetite for wealth taxes and for, uh, for which tax would people prefer to see if there was an increase in taxes and the choices were VAT, income tax, wealth tax and inheritance tax and by far the biggest winner was wealth tax. Just this year, just now, um, Patriotic Millionaires, who I spoke about before, ran the same survey again through Servation and if anything that amount of people has grown and actually the effect, the amount by which they want to tax wealth was also fairly chunky probably a lot more than um we'd be suggesting to be honest but it shows that there is public appetite and perhaps that the public narrative is that somehow the system is not working for ordinary people this year we launched a petition a wealth tax petition and we had um 2000 signatures i think it was the quickest uptake in Catcher's career, we've had a lot of help though, amplification from allies in um, the tax justice movement. So we work, as I say, with other groups. And if we put out a petition on Twitter, often they will share it on. Our friends at Catch are asking for this. And so we reach a wider audience and we do that for them too. Just this week, we asked people who had done that to go a step further, so a slightly higher bar to write to their MP and ask their MP to badger the Chancellor. And on the very first day, 200 people took that action. Um, I'm not sure what the figure is today, but we were just delighted. It doesn't mean that we'll get the outcome we want, but it does mean that we're raising public awareness, 
changing the narrative. And faith leaders and other allies are speaking out on the subject too. So Rowan Williamson, uh, Rowan Williams, uh, uh, Alan Smith, Bishop Alan Smith of St Albans and various other um, faith leaders in various denominations have um, lent their voice to the call and we're really grateful for that. Tax justice matters a lot at all levels in church life, whether it's preaching, praying, personal engagement. Sometimes that's about raising our tax literacy. Uh, if you're like me, when I was, well, when I see a, a page of closely typed numbers, my brain goes slightly mushy and I don't look forward to it. But actually, it's important to be just familiar enough to talk with confidence about the need for tax justice. It doesn't mean that people need to know everything. It just means they need to know there's an issue. It's about the full realization of a Christian way of life. So as I said before, sometimes people think they can have different ethics in their personal lives from their business lives. We would suggest that God expects us to behave in a similar way right across the spectrum of our lives. Sometimes it can be relevant to the day to day practical life of the church. So where they invest their money are the companies that they're investing in behaving responsibly from a tax perspective. Um, do the suppliers that they're buying the cleaning materials and the heating and so forth from, do they pay a living wage and pay their fair taxes as well? And most importantly, I guess, the church and Christians have a voice. We don't always use it as effectively as we could. Um, I have a colleague who works in a related field and he says, I can't tell you how many times I've come to a prayer meeting and heard someone say, thank you, God, that we can come together and pray and worship you and give thanks without fear of persecution. And he says, if we're not being persecuted, we're doing it wrong because we're not speaking out against injustice. And it's hard and it's unappealing sometimes and it takes some courage. But that's what I'd suggest we're called to do. Catch aims to help people act on these issues. We provide worship resources. We provide study group materials. We provide speakers, me. Uh, we have a fortnightly newsletter. Um, and we're also on social media in all sorts of ways. Um, we have occasional online group Bible studies. I think we're overdue one soon. And we are looking for people, not many, just a handful, who would like to become volunteer tax justice champions. That is to become comfortable enough with how important tax is in leveling up and leveling out the injustice in our system so that everybody can thrive. And really not to do too much, to be willing to perhaps help run a tax justice survey, um, service, or to take a table at an event if we supply literature and so on and so forth. What, what do we ask you personally to do? Encourage one another, encourage one another. Keep tax justice in mind in your regular church life Support Tax Justice Sunday if you can. That's June the 12th this year. It's part of what's called Fair Tax Week. One of our allies, the Fair, the Ta the Fair Tax Mark, Fair Tax Foundation, um, runs it every year. And we pick up the baton with the churches for Tax Justice Sunday. If you would like to run a dedicated service, and it doesn't have to be on that day, it can be any time around then, we can provide you with a full resource pack with sermon outlines and prayers and um, relevant hymns. And we'd love to see more churches signing up to do just that. Uh, I've talked about many of those other things. Um, also, always very important, donate. Uh, we're a tiny organization, Catch Itself, which is one of the two major programs ECCR runs, is me four days a week and um, then a half share in our uh, campaigns manager. So we're teeny tiny, and that's really why we're looking for support. That's where you can find us. Um, and we are, as I say, on social media. 
if you'd like any resources, please let me know and I'll make sure you get them. And oh, come to the end. And I'm going to stop sharing. I'm really grateful that you're all, most of you, still here. That's really good to see. Um, and I'm hoping there are a couple of questions. Um, wh what I want to say as well, I think, is that tax, tax justice, um, tax injustice is growing. Economic injustice is growing and tax injustice is growing. The share of their income that the very wealthy keep now compared to a few decades ago is much more. The share of their income that the very, the very poor and medium poor, medium uh, keep is, is falling, is falling. So inequality is on the rise. It's well embedded in our society. It's damaging and it's not what God wants to see happening in our communities. Time for me to take a breath. Thank you very, very much, Kat, for explaining so clearly and uh, profoundly the, the issues that uh, uh, Catch is, is looking at. So far, there are two questions, um, but please um, feel free, uh, those online, to offer some more. Uh, there's a question from Gordon. Um, your wealth tax campaign does not mention land value tax. What view do you have it? have on it. It bothers me that I'm sitting on you know, half a million pounds worth of property, which I've done virtually nothing to create, just buying a house in the right place at the right time. To me, this is very unjust. Yes. Do you yeah. know, I can, yes. that, that, yeah. that's a, that's a common, commonly asked question. What will it mean for me? Will I be caught? Um, and for many people, particularly in the southeast of England, um, if they own property or land, it's rocketed in value. So they might not think of themselves as rich, but they have a lot of wealth tied up in the property and they want to know whether it would be caught by that tax. The answer is potentially yes. So we do believe that property should be included in a person's net wealth. Um, if it has a mortgage on it, then that outstanding mortgage would be deducted. So it's a net wealth tax. What you own after what you owe has been deducted. Um, under some wealth tax models in some places, people's main residence, so their home, is deducted from um, an assessment of their wealth. And others include all assets, including homes. Um, so just to talk about, um, just to expand that a little bit, we're proposing that a wealth tax would affect the richest 1% of people in the UK, and that's about 60, 670 odd thousand people. So to give you an idea of who might be caught by that, the wealth of the richest 1% of households is, is more than 230 times that of the poorest 10%. So there's a massive gulf, and those figures are from this year, from the Office of National Statistics. And the top 1% of households have wealth of more than 3.6 million each and they hold the top one percent of households hold 43 percent of all the wealth in great britain and these are the people we're su suggesting should be subject to a wealth tax so it's quite true to say that somebody with, with a piece of land or a property that's gone up lots in value could be caught within it um, we think that's reasonable but depend it would depend on um the model that's used um, may I, before you go on may i just um sorry I, I think gordon you also asked um about difficulties in assessing land taxes and we know that in those countries that do have wealth taxes and property taxes there can be difficulty in terms of valuing in terms of liquidity their challenges and quite often they're put up by policymakers who don't want to do it. Those challenges are, are used as an excuse not to do it, but they're surmountable. So um, you can have a valuation that remains valid for 
however many years, you can um, allow for accumulated taxes to be paid upon sale of an asset. Um, there are ways around it. Okay, there are two uh, other questions that have uh, come up. Um, well, actually three. Uh, one is uh, ethical investment. Would you see that including the banks used for savings and current accounts? Oh, when we talk about ethical investment, would we include bank accounts, do you mean? Or do you mean, Dave, um, would the bank account be included in the net wealth? I'll answer both just in case. I'm assuming yeah, okay. yeah, that, yeah. Um, that you mean the former, because yes, cash would be included. Um, and ethical banking, yeah, tricky. Um, and um, my colleague, Rosie Vanner, who runs our parallel program, Money Makes Change, which is all about what you do with your money, how you spend it, how you invest it and so forth, has some really good resources on which are the best banks and what sorts of questions you might want to ask your bank um, in terms of what they do with your money. Uh, so um, here in the Isle of Man, we have very little option. We don't have a triados who are usually regarded as best of the best, but we do have a credit union, which is, uh, pretty good. In the UK, um, many people choose to switch from those banks that are using their money to fund fossil fuel industries, palm oil exploitation and so forth. Um, so I would recommend going to our site and having a look at uh, Money Makes Changes work on ethical banking and the sort of questions you might like to ask. Um. Question here. Um, sorry, I'm just. Uh, what about pension rights and ownership of businesses? Are there any? Yeah. Um, so pension rights, uh, I guess they're somewhat easier to deal with where people have um, what you would call um, defined contribution schemes as opposed to defined salary schemes. Mm. Um, but most often that they need the wealth taxes need to be levied at a point where something is being crystallized because within a pension wrapper if that's the right term to use um, things can go up and down and you don't know what the actual value that crystallizes on retirement uh, is going to be until that date so we would suggest that pension rights should be included and indeed there are those who are suggesting that uh the tax favoured treatment of pension contributions should also be done away with because typically it's the preserve of people who are doing well and the poor don't get any such magnification of their meagre savings if any so that debate is going on it's not one that we or I at least have engaged in but I have seen calls for um, for that to be the case Ownership of business, yes. And again, that's particularly with family businesses that are hard to value, that can be tricky, um, particularly in terms of valuation and liquidity. Uh, but again, there are mechanisms for managing that, for storing up a, li a tax liability until there is something liquidated and the like. Um, there's uh, another comment here. Well, there are two couple of comments about um, Old Testament references uh, to wealth. So um, <clears throat> the, the, um, there's the concept in the Old Testament of jubilee re redistribution mm. from to Moses in the wilderness to collect only enough of the day and um, not to hoard manna. Is there any thoughts there Re absolutely sort of relevance and um uh, in particular to your campaign yeah so the deuteron deuteronomical and um levitical um guidance that we find has so much to say about um jubilee and the the clearing of debts 
and not only the clearing of debts, but an admonition to uh, don't decline to lend because you know that next year is a jubilee year and you'll have to write it all off. Um, so it just goes to show that um, the author had a fairly, fairly clear idea of human nature. We'd see a lot in the, and, and if you're interested, there's a wonderful book called um, Sabbath Economics uh, by Ched Myers, who's an American um, theologian. Uh, he's, he's a really good read. Um, and we, f f my interpretation of that is that God sees inequality as something that is really to be fought against, that ideally that avoidance of um, the building up of money and power in one place and the subjugation of the poor in another. Ideally, avoiding that would come from a place of love, but we humans have to work at love and we have to work at being good. And so having a rule like Jubilee debt clearing helps to give a mechanism for uh, leveling out that inequality, those, those increases in wealth at startling levels. There's some debate about whether those practices ever actually happened to a significant degree, whether they were universal within those communities. Um, but nevertheless, the admonition's there. Um, there's a comment here from uh, Amanda that, uh, OK, that there are wealth taxes uh, imposed, hopefully in some sort of future uh, government rethinking, if the consequence is that the wealthy leave the country, wouldn't that in a sense mean that we're all as a community less well off, that we're in a worse place? So mm -hmm. is yeah. there... A, I was talking to Aaron Adani, that? who's at Greenwich University, about that very thing the other day. Is it true to say that, for example, many of these very wealthy people also have non-DOM status, and so they pay very little, they pay nothing on their world, worldwide arising income unless they bring it into the country. If we start taxing non-DOMs on their worldwide income, if we start taxing the wealthy on their wealth, will they leave the country? It's very hard, it's very hard to know the answer, but it seems improbable. The people who are going to be global citizens in the interest of minimising their tax are probably already doing it. Um, some, and th there's also a question around how much, how much benefit they really do bring to society. So do they, do the wealthy that come and live here and use mechanisms so as not to pay even tax on the income on their wealth, do they contribute that much to society? Often not. Um, so I wish I had a crystal ball. I can't tell you the answer to it. Um, I would suspect that fewer people would leave than, um, than we imagine because people don't disrupt their affairs and move their families and move their businesses for no, for purely for tax. Certainly, the argument's been had in terms of corporates uh, that a good company does not choose a location purely on the basis of its tax friendliness and tax competitiveness. Um, it chooses it on the basis of, sorry, I've just seen how much that light is unhelpful behind me. I'll try and move my head a little. It chooses it on the basis of the right skills being in place, the right infrastructure being in place, the right legislation being in place. Doubtless there'd be some people who'd leave, but I don't think it would be. Um, if we're not getting if we're not getting the income on that wealth anyway, I, I don't think we'd be losing much for the few that might go. Yeah. I could be wrong. Um, there's uh, a question that came a while ago from John and Vanessa Purdy. Uh, is agreement needed internationally? And if so, how can it be achieved? so that tax stays in the region's production and where societal rights, justice and support can be safeguarded? Ah, that's such a good question. I think it 
probably relates more to corporate tax if you're talking about where the functions carried on i think i heard that correctly um, that's exactly what we would be arguing for in terms of international corporate tax agreements that's exactly what the global tax agreement was meant to produce the biden tax as it's called because joe biden proposed it it's exactly what not is not happening and needs to happen um, and is keeping struggling countries poor there is uh, there are calls for alternative mechanisms so um for example within the tax justice movement there are calls for the un to become a tax policing body uh, because they have more of an eye to human rights and uh, there are good arguments to say that abusive tax treatments are contrary to human rights to the ability of a government to sustain its people sorry it's not that it's uh, i can move it's not actually a light it's the sunshine behind me i'm just moving i hope that's a little better yeah um here's here's a question and we're probably um uh getting near towards the end of our time there's a question from barbara also endorsed by gordon also endorsed by me actually uh there are many pensioners who enjoy pensions which are equivalent to the wages of middle income workers is it fair that we do not pay national insurance that's a really good question um well it, i i've i've heard the argument that many pensioners would be willing to pay ni on their earnings um i'm sure it's not universal I can't see why i can't see personally why they wouldn't um i have not seen figures to tell me how much that would generate is it fair that we don't pay national insurance i'm presuming you mean on um earned income while you're a pensioner um no i, I mean on unearned income cat oh okay or, yeah no i i, I not absolutely working, not earning a wage yeah equivalent to a middle income worker why do why am i not asked to pay national insurance yeah I, I i have to say i'd agree um people hold this people hold national insurance in a sort of mythic perspective in their minds sometimes they think it's all about funding um social care and health care um and that might have been the original intent but it just goes into the pot into the general revenue with everything else so when national insurance goes up you can say income tax on workers is effectively going up so arguably there is no reason why and I shouldn't be levied um, on on pensioners who have a reasonable income. And it's interesting to think. Do have a guess? What do you think? What level of income do you think would put you into the top one percent of earners on the planet? Any guesses? You can bang it in the chat, or you can sing it out. These figures are a couple of years old. But I'm going to startle you. If you earn thirty-five thousand a year, which is comfortable, but it's not a king's ransom, you are in the top one percent of income earners in the world. And that sounds improbable when you realise that some CEOs are earning millions and millions and millions. But then, when you remember that the median income on the planet is two thousand dollars a year, two thousand dollars a year it brings that right down it, it puts it in perspective sometimes we feel hard done by but it's all a question of degree i think we're probably moving uh towards the 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 end of uh, the discussion i'd just like to pose uh a question i thought of uh right at the beginning which is about um what do we do in unjust societies about paying tax? I mean, there's a very clear biblical statement that however unjust they are, you pay the tax. Um, would you endorse that? I would endorse it, but I would say that at the same time, we should be using our voices to call for 
um, a rejig of the system loudly and frequently. Um, I'm remembering that we have votes. We can choose to vote for people who might um, change that system, and that all takes time. We can pray for the people making those decisions, both our elected leaders and those in um, government in the civil service. Timothy says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And so many people are struggling to lead lives of any dignity. Part of the problem of inequality is that not only does it mean that some are poor, that's not bad of itself, but it also brings shame sometimes to people that they can't, they feel inadequate, that they can't feed their kids, they can't do the things that their neighbours are doing. And um, we need a society that's compassionate and gives dignity to all. Okay, I think we're going to um, uh, finish now. So, um, Kat, thank you very, very much for the time that you've spent with us this evening, the clarity of your thinking. Um, I'm definitely going to write to, to my MP um, and it'll be great to uh, have your slide shows um, uh, sent round so we can all think about how we can best respond to what you've uh, told us this evening. So thank you very, very much. And yeah. um, it was worth waiting for.